just received a new program and uh, according to the program we are on time. <laughs> so there's a um, bus and then 9.30 we start with uh, Ed Naravitsius. So it's a pleasure to have you and talking about cold molecular collisions. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you for invitation. It's really wonderful to be here. First time I'm actually crossing equator. Don't worry, I will ignore your signal. Okay. I think it's okay. It's at least green. Ah, okay, no problem. Okay. So understand it's a day of surprises. I also had an interesting surprise at nine o'clock seeing empty hall. So <laughs> thank you very much also. <laughs> so what I will tell you about today, it's a little bit different story. Two stories actually. One story about long range and chemistry. So it's really two body collisions, and you will see how in chemistry and why in chemistry long range interactions are important. And second part of the story will take me a bit different path, and I will show you what does it take and where are we in cooling the molecules. So again, we are also in the game of getting as cold as possible the molecules, and I will try to show you how we do it, what are our ideas, and where are we now. So without too much, you know, okay, let's see. Would be nice. Yes, great. Oh, thank you very much. So first of all, the team, it's, I'm really lucky. I had excellent students. Part of my work, as I will tell you, was done by Yuval Shagam and Prerna. Nabanita, she's a postdoc. These are people who do collisions in my lab. These are people who do also collisions now, after 10 years of development, with uh, trapped uh, molecular samples. So it's led by Ir. Michael is a PhD, two PhD students, and Martin, he's an excellent postdoc from Germany. Looking for positions to anybody? Great guys. So, now let's dive in. Long range and chemistry. Why and when is it important? So usually when you think about chemistry, you don't think about long-range interactions. Why? Because, you know, what is a typical reaction that you will do, right? You will take, I don't know, a pan and you will prepare tapioca, right? So this is high temperature. So changes happen, but at very high energies, right? So you have, to, you have a potential barrier somewhere. You have to have enough kinetic energy to overcome that barrier. And then you go from reactants into products. So really, you have very, very good separation between products and reactants. Now, when you think about interstellar space, right, you have many, many dark areas, and this area is dark because of actual molecular absorption. So this is, I think, CO image. So there are many reactions taking place at very low temperatures. So clearly, any reaction that has a barrier will be suppressed, exponential suppressed. It will not happen at 10 Kelvin. Forget about it. So surprisingly enough, Almost all of the chemistry that takes place in interstellar space is governed only by long-range interactions. And I will show you a very, very simple model that probably can explain 80% of what we see. So let's go on. So what do I need to explain you? Right? We are very low energies. There are no barriers. So all I need to do is to take two objects and bring them close enough so that reaction happens. So in my approximation, first approximation, reaction only happens when the separation between two objects is small, on the order of dimension of the object. So we need to approach. So what do I need to be able to estimate, to estimate collisional cross-section? As simple as that. And that actually is quite easy. So we start with two particles. It doesn't matter which one can be ion, molecule, pol polar molecule, neutral molecule, without a dipole, whatever. Pick your poison and you easily construct long-range interactions. So it will have two terms. One term usually in 90% of cases is attractive term. So it's a power law depending on what type of particle interacts. And of course, you have that centrifugal term. So you add these two, and what do you build? You build this nice red curve. What you see here, you immediately recognize that at long separations, we start building again barriers. So this is so-called centrifugal barrier. Why it is important? Because I need to do chemistry, right? I need to reach short separation, so this nice black hole. So I have to have energy high enough to go over the centrifugal barrier. So a classical approximation. If I have enough energy, I go over, I reach short separation, reaction happens. Well, let's assume the unit probability. And if my energy, again, is below centrifugal barrier, 
I simply reflect, no reaction. So this approximation is from 1905. It was done by Langevin for ion-atom interaction. Why this is important? Because in two lines, taking this simple in long-range interaction form, you can arrive how your collisional cross-section or reaction rate depends on energy. It's really two lines. All you need to do is to estimate the height of your potential barrier. And then, laws, universal, well, not really universal, but nearly universal laws for chemistry at very low collision energy. What do they show? How reaction rate or collisional cross-section depends on energy. So this is the result derived by Langevin and has beautifully shown by Ian Sims and Stefan Village. So Sims did it, I think, 20 years already ago. Stefan did it 10 years ago, also beautiful experiments, demonstrating that, for example, reaction rate for ion neutral interaction does not depend on collision energy. So you can tune your collision energy from 100 Kelvin to millikelvin, and the reaction rate just stays constant, which is quite surprising. We played similar games in our experiments, and why it is nice? Because the simple right, uh, relation between long-range interaction and reaction rate as a function of collision energy brings you a tool that allows you to tell what type of interaction you have. And we played exactly that game. So this is, for example, reaction rate. As a function of collision energy, you see quite a few decades of energy scanned here for oxygen hitting metastable helium. So atom, molecule interaction, both are neutral particles. Hydrogen here is rotational ground state. And as expected, what you see, you see e to the power of 1 over 6, which matches exactly what type of interaction dispersion wonder about. So I don't need even to know. I go to my lab measure reaction rate as a function of collision energy, and I know exactly the type of interaction I have. What was surprised here, you go to rotational excited hydrogen with the same metastable helium atom, and suddenly you see that instead of e to the power of 1 over 6, it's a different power law, 1 over 10. Where does that come from? So this is a different type of interaction. Actually, this is quadruple-quadruple interaction. So really, molecular symmetry changes the type of interaction. And we are sensitive to that part because we can measure our collision rates over a very large energy range and with quite high precision. Now, so this is completely classical. Very simple model, 1905. Is there anything quantum here? Of course there is. So when you will see something quantum, when the absorption, right, at short separation, it's not unit anymore. If it's unit, forget about it, right? You don't have a cavity. You have one mirror, right, and then nothing just a black hole. So if you have a probability to reflect back from short separation, you will form these nice scattering resonances. So they're called usually shape resonances. How you will observe them? Scan anything as a function of energy, cross-section, reaction rate, and you will see a beautiful peak. But that's a hard game. Why it's a hard game? Because you can immediately realize that angular momentum is quantized. There are many states and if I want to be able to resolve these scattering resonances, I cannot live, I cannot do my experiment when I have 100 quantum states contributing to collision. So you have to be at collision energies low enough that you limit the number of partial waves. To how many? Let's say to five. Okay? That brings me to this very simple slide, just to show you that you cannot speak, of course, in absolute temperatures. So here you have three very different systems, two body systems interacting, Quantum mechanics, again, partial waves, resonances, but each one shows exactly the same physics at very different absolute energy scale. So if you take something that interacts extremely strongly, ion with rubidium, which is heavy and polarizable, you will have only a few partial waves at microkelvins, actually even less. Well, if you remove charge, you go to two neutral particles, but here we have two heavy polarizable molecules, this is what June and Debbie Jin did, well, it's higher energy, it reaches some millikelvins. Do what we do, go to very light particles, almost non-polarizable, like H2, and polarizability is almost nothing, like helium, and you have exactly the same physics now in Kelvin range. So forget about absolute temperature, somebody tells you ultra-cold, chemistry, don't believe them, ask them what type of interaction you're talking about. Because for ion, ultra-cold, is hundreds of nanokelvin, 
for light particles, neutral particles, ultra cold, is milliken oven easily. How did we do it? It's also tricky, right? So we don't want to use laser coolant. Why? Because we want to work with molecules. What type of molecules? For example, H2. Anyone knows how to cool H2? Laser coolant? Well, of course not. So it even has no dipole, right? So no transitions. But nevertheless, we can actually do very cold collision experiments with H2. How we do it? We use molecular beams. So Ed, I think, mentioned a little bit about molecular beams. What are we? It's a simple jet, right? Same as you have, I don't know, in space shuttle, right? That you have. You let gas expand from very high pressure to vacuum, and you generate a very cold beam, or bunch, because we are using very short pulse. Now, if you just let these two pulses cross and collide, your relative energy is too high. It's hundreds of Kelvin. So what did we do? Extremely simple experiment. One of our bunches is paramagnetic. It can be O2, it can be a radical, it can be an atom, almost any atom. And we deflect it using a magnetic guide. So simple wall, which is very high magnetic field gradient, a few Tesla per millimeter, our particles hit it running at 1,000 meters per second and make a turn. So this is what the red bunch is doing, just turning by 10 degrees. The blue bunch, this is H2, for example, it just goes straight. We don't manipulate it, well, we don't know how to manipulate it. What is the result? The result is two beams, each one running at 1,000 meters per second, but the relative velocity well, is zero. Collision energy is limited by local distribution of velocities. Translate that to energy, and you get to millikelvin. So super simple trick that brings you from room temperature to actually S wave in a single experiment. We played a lot with that. So one of the experiments, so what do you see here? This is again reaction rate as a function of collision energy. These are three isotopes of hydrogen, H2, HD, D2. And you see as in any quantum system, the Rolle wavelength changes, and you start shifting this uh, shape resonance structure. So this is a measurement that we can easily do, simply counting, right? We measure collisional cross-sections. Well, we can do now more. We can image our collisions. So what do you see here? It's image of two particles colliding and diffracting. So it's a va matter wave diffraction, which we can easily see in our lab. This is just raw image from our detector. What do you see here? Why do you see these stripes? So it's interference between different partial waves. We start with a monochromatic beam. So it, you have to think now, go from plane wave into basis of uh, partial waves. So there are only five partial waves interfering here. And these nice stripes just show you exactly that feature. So there's a lot of information that now we can gain. But all of that, of course, is general also to atoms. What's molecular? So again, bring you back to molecules. Which molecule? H2. And H2 is really funny molecule. Why? There are actually two types of uh, hydrogen. They're completely, in a sense, unrelated. Why? Because you have spin of nucleus, of proton. Right? It's a fermion. So spin statistics, fermionic sp uh, spin statistics, dictates that you have two different types of hydrogen. One is parahydrogen. So this is sim anti-symmetric wave function for nuclear spin. So the lowest rotational state of H2 is G equal to zero. Symmetric, everything is cool, clear, no problem. This is a funny thing. So now orthohydrogen, nuclear wave function is symmetric. Now nature has a problem, right? Fermions. So these two fermions cannot occupy the same space. So if I would have G equal to zero state, well, rotation would bring me two fermions to be on the same spot. So that cannot happen. What nature does, well, it just deletes all even rotational state. So the lowest rotational state for orthohydrogen is G equal to 1. And that's what you have. So if you take H2 in interstellar space, it's a mixture of two different molecules. One has rotational ground state, so it's a symmetric object. Another is also a symmetric object, but it has angular momentum. What will happen if I will look in my experiment, play with these two different species? My intuition was there shouldn't be any difference. Classically. And classically, I'm completely correct. So here you see again cross section or reaction rate doesn't matter, it's collision energy. We start from 300 Kelvin down to 1 Kelvin. Black is rotational ground state, red is rotational excited state. And indeed, one within the error bar of another. Nothing, dif no difference whatsoever. 
you go to below one Kelvin, and you see that a very strong shape uh, resonance actually appears only in a single channel, only in rotational excited state. So it's a crazy experiment. Think about it. I have now a collisional experiment with near laser sensitivity. Another way to take a mixture of H2 and decide how much of a rotational excited state I have is to do spectroscopy. And here there's no laser. This is a simple collisional experiment. And I can tell you what is the fraction of each one of these within a percent. It's really extremely high sensitivity. So with our collaborators, with Christiane Koch, we played with this a lot. Because that gives you a really nice handle. So one handle rotational state changes, again, long-range interaction. If you are in the ground rotational state, your interaction is completely isotropic. If you want to see an isotropy, if you want to see the molecular feature in collision, you actually have to look at rotational excited state. So what happens here, just a very short uh, explanation. So what an isotropy is doing here, so this is the block that you should look, right? That's my only Hamiltonian in my the whole talk. So bear with me. A, so what does an isotropy do? It re removes degeneracy in between three different rotational states of H2 with different azimuthal quantum number. And that's it. So you have instead of three, you have two different states. One is the potential well lifted a little bit in energy, that pushes out a bound state, and this bound state becomes a sheep resonance. And that's exactly what we see in experiment. So you can use this as extremely sensitive probe of interaction. Okay, so all of that, two body physics, Again, long range is extremely important. We probe it with crazy accuracy now. What's next? So we are really, what, what we would like to do, of course, is to push into ultra cold, to see many body effects. But that's tricky, right? So when you think about a typical atom cooling experiment, right, you always start with oven. Uh, all, many, many experiments start with oven or thermal uh, source. You decelerate if you need, right, for example, for sodium. You generate mod, and then last step usually is just evaporation. So I think that I don't need to repeat. There's a lot of work done with molecules, but most of that is, is uh, with laser cooled atoms. So you start with laser cooled atoms and build your molecule, which is great. Laser cooling also, there are quite a few groups started by DeMille. Now Mike Tarbot is doing uh, amazing work and also John Doyle and Carson right? So you can directly cool, but still the densities are extremely low. So it's very hard to observe collisions with these molecules. There are completely different ways to cool molecules. Forget about laser cooling. Different sources. So this is, uh, I think, experiment from 1999, again, done by John Doyle. Well, wh what is the cooling mechanism here? Cold helium, buffer gas. There was also 19, I think 2000, Gerard Meyer brought a beautiful idea to start with supersonic expansion, again, this molecular beam, decelerate it, and trap it. So again, this is my cooling stage, Deceleration trapping, cool. This is Gerard Rempe, also using sort of, not really buffer gas, but again, a fusive source. Now he can even decelerate and trapping electrostatically. So many, many experiments. And wh where, are, where did we stand? So 2007, this was a result again from Gerard Meyer's group. You see trapping of OH and OD, and you see this beautiful exponential decay, which of course tells two things. First of all, we heat, uh, they heat up. Why do they heat up? Because of black body radiation. Second, you don't observe collisions. How do you observe collisions? You, you want to see non-exponential decay, which unfortunately, no one was able to see. So we have a very general way to cool, right? All of these nice methods are more general. I don't depend on, you know, something that I can laser cool, but our densities were never high enough. So this is something that we really wanted to solve. It took us 10 years. Okay, so let me walk you through this experiment that we built. So again, the starting point is molecular beam. Why molecular beam? Because the, probably the hardest thing with molecules is to cool the internal degrees of freedom, rotations and vibrations. And this is done automatically, right? I don't need to think and I need to do absolutely nothing. There are enough collisions and you easily reach rotational vibrational ground state. What is the price that you pay? No free lunch. You have a very high velocity bunch. A few hundred meters per second easily, or well, up to thousands meters per second. So we cannot evaporate on the scale of milliseconds 
So first thing that we need to do, we need to slow. Okay, so that's something that we can do. How do we slow? It's a simple idea, actually. But what you see here, it's a sequence of solenoids. We have around 1,000 of them in our lab. And what we do, we build a magnetic box. So here, I catch my cloud of cold molecules. I run with it slowly until I stop and eventually we load it in a trap that in first generation was built from two permanent magnets. Okay, so easy on uh, PowerPoint, a bit more difficult in the real world. That's the usual story, so slide where is easy. So what do you see here? Let me sort of walk you through. This thing here, so it's two and a half meters long. It's not bent, don't worry. I just, the lab is too small, so I had to use panorama. So this is our decelerator. 480 overlapping quadrupole traps, so about 1,000 overall pulses, uh, coils. This is the source. This is actually how it looks. You can image it beautifully. This is our detection chamber. This is where we trap our molecules. So three meters long, 480 stages. We have to have high magnetic fields, so we pulse a lot of current. And the deceleration that we reach is 3,000 G. So lucky that you know we don't complain because otherwise that's not be would be hard. So what's the plan? Is clear. So in 2017, this all thing worked. Five minutes, okay, six. <laughs> so uh, that worked surprisingly well. So we decelerate, trap, and detect. What did we decelerate? We used oxygen. Why oxygen? It has magnetic moment. For fun, we also added lithium. And what we are able to do to measure our lifetimes. And that sucks big time. Why? Because again, what do we see? First of all, time scales is a second. Within a second, you see that we are left with no molecules and atoms. Lifetimes are miserable, and we decay exponentially. So, back to square one, no collision. So, that brought us back to square one, and we thought, well, what do we need to do? We need to see collision. So, longer lifetime, clear. Second thing, permanent magnets are not a good idea, right? Why? Because I load our molecules inside, and there's absolutely no knob that I can turn in the lab. And you want to have a knob. And what knob you want to have is a compression knob. So ideally, I want to be able to take cloud of molecules, which is not dense enough. It doesn't have high enough collision rate, and just adiabatically compress it. Well, for, for that, of course, I need something, you know, that I can do it uh, on the fly. So the regular coils, it will never work. We use superconductors. If anybody is interested, can I, get, can I can tell it's a long story and funny story. But eventually, we build a trap, a, DC, a trap which is built out of high temperature superconductors. So nobody knows how they work, but they work perfectly well. And now, again, yeah, this is my Hamiltonian. You diagonalize all of that. Hard. So this is what we had two years ago, and this is what we have now. So first of all, let's start with a dilute sample. What is the dilute sample? So we start with a dense cloud of O2, and we simply release our trap. Why we can't do it? Well, because actually we have now the knob in our lab that controls how deep is our trap. So we start with 15 millikelvin, and knock, 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 knock. So here is the lifetime. This is log scale. So again, beautiful exponent. Lifetime, well, 50 seconds. How long we can hold our O2? 90 seconds, minute and a half. So that, perfect, no problem, solved. Now, let's increase the density. So you increase the density, what happens? You clearly start seeing a non-exponential decay. So that's it. Here you are. First time that we have collisions between molecules that were generated without any laser coil. So that is really, really nice. So paper will appear soon. You can meanwhile uh, see it in, uh, on archive just for fun. Sanity checks are important, right? So we did another funny experiment by loading mixture. Mixtures are also interesting. Why? You can do chemistry, and of course you can do sympathetic cooling. So we load, co-load lithium and oxygen. So this is lithium without O2. It's not dense, so again, just the exponential decay. Lifetime, 14 seconds. Oxygen, lifetime about nine seconds. Two together, lithium is kicked out of the trap within two seconds. Why? It's much lighter. So it's evaporating. It's really evaporating out of track. 
Is this problem solved? Almost. Not really. So we are close, but we are not that we are yet there. Why? Because we need for evaporation, what we need to have, we need to have, of course, more elastic collisions than inelastic by at least a factor of 20. If we are 20 times more probable to elastically scatter, we will thermalize and we will easily see. Unfortunately, we are not. So we can measure it now, so we are about good to bad collision rate, about 10. So, what's next? So loading works, collision work, evaporation will not work with oxygen. So oxygen, I hate oxygen. You, you also should, you know, really think about it better now. It doesn't evaporate, so the collisional properties are not so good. So what do we do now as we speak? So we are playing with different isotopes. Why? Again, spin statistics. 1717 or 1618 mixed isotopes have very different rotational structure. Again, symmetric ground state. So we hope it will have maybe more favorable uh, uh, properties. Next will be NH2. Has actually only one state to decay, so also should, be be should work better. And the beauty of it, it's easy for us to see. We don't depend on laser cooling. We're changing the bottle, and detection is quite universal. We usually ionize. That's not so complicated. So I hope you know that will work. And let me finish again thanking my group. This is the extended version with a few people, you know, pho Photoshop inside. And of course, for all of the funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.